Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Sew Time webinar for 2024. I um, hope everyone is having a warm and easy way into 2024. Today, our topic is focusing on health and wellness, getting beyond fat phobia stereotypes webinar. I'm Destiny, the media strategist for Seeds of Healing, or SO. SO is an HIV awareness and advocacy organization whose mission is to deconstruct myths that perpetuate HIV stigma. Our work seeks to eliminate disparities for Black women living with HIV. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our SoTime platform and posted on our YouTube channel for you to share with others or come back to watch yourself. Attendees are able to drop questions in the chat box and they will be shared at the end of the webinar, but these will be anonymous in the chat box. So if you want to ask an anonymous question, please use the Q&A feature. And please feel free to ask any questions and write comments throughout the program. Before we get started, I would like to introduce you to our speakers today. We have Marnina Miller, who is a highly accomplished human rights activist and social media strategist with a profound commitment to fostering positive change in society. As a community outreach associate at the Southern AIDS Coalition, Ms. Miller channels her passion for social justice into impactful in initiatives centered around HIV advocacy. And we have Dr. Constance Foreman, who received her Doctor of Medicine degree and completed her residency in family medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Dr. Constance has held various leadership positions over the years, but is most proud of commissioning in the United States Navy Reserve. Dr. Constance understands that the health of an individual extends beyond the walls of a clinic or hospital and found beyond clinic walls wellness, a health coaching and a health education business with the purpose of reminding people that with a practical and sustainable lifestyle changes, we can all be healthy. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much for having us. I'm so excited about today's topic. What about you, Constance? Me too. And I, I think uh, with our powers combined, we can have an amazing <laughs> presentation. And um, I appreciate you being here and excited to hear what you have to say. All righty. I'm excited to be here too. So without further, what's your most exciting thing about today? What are you most excited about, about this conversation? What's most exciting is being able to um, participate in something that's positive, positively impacting my direct community. So living here in Wilmington and seeing what um, Seeds of Healing is doing means a lot to be able to participate. Okay, and I'm really excited about talking about how Black women are um, impacted by fat phobia, um, especially women living with HIV. Um, I'm super excited about talking about all of the things that impact Black women and our uh, health disparities around fat phobia and things like that. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen so that we can get started and talk about these Yes, things. and you know, while you're doing that, I think it's important to acknowledge that these conversations are often best had with individuals with real life experience, right? So um, being able to share your experiences in addition to sharing um, what I know from a clinical standpoint is, is gonna make this a magical presentation. It will, it will. I'm really excited to share what we have um, been talking about and collaborating with. So um, my name is Marnina Miller. I'm definitely gonna go first. Um, I am an HIV activist, as was so beautifully stated before in our introductions. I love talking about things around fat phobia, breaking down stereotypes, and I'm so excited that Seeds of Healing um, decided to have me here today. Um, and definitely as a person living with HIV and as a queer person, as a plus size person, this topic is so important to me because we typically don't talk about the ways in which body image and the way in which we live our lives have an impact on our bodies. So here's me and my lovely, lovely, lovely co-host today. Um, my name is Marnina Miller, as <laughs> I've stated before, and here's Dr. Constance. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us, here is our um, website. This is and the way it's also to get in, in the chat as well. It is. It is. We got some great folks on tech making sure that we hit all those notes. So here's some of the objectives for some of the stuff I want to talk about today. I want to talk about body image and stigma and how body image and stigma impacts 
someone's life. Uh, we, we're going to talk about and explore how societal beauty standards really impact someone's bodies, someone's life, and someone's health. We'll talk about how HIV-related stigma and the intersections of body image and uh, HIV impact someone's overall health outcomes. We're also going to talk about access to care, and we're going to talk about how living in a larger body can impact your access to care. We'll also talk about intersectional discrimination. Now, we will talk about a lot around HIV stigma and how stigma impacts someone's life, but we do not live single issue lives. And Audre Lorde uh, activist said that one time, and that is such a true statement because typically when folks are living with HIV, that's the one thing people think we think about, but that's the smallest part of my day. That little pill is the smallest part of my day, I'm thinking about the racism, the sexism, the misogynoir, which is the misogyny that Black women face, how all of those things impact my life. Um, that pill, that HIV pill is one pill that I take, um, but it's so much other things that impact my daily life. And then we're going to talk about language and stereotypes and how people like to stereotype folks who are living in larger bodies. I'm excited for all of that. Me too, me too. <laughs> so fat phobia is a form of oppression, says Kate Mann. And she was a philosopher who was studying the impacts that fat phobia has had on the lives of people that live in larger bodies. And she's done a lot of integrated research and a lot of community-based research to impact her statement here. And she was just telling us that, hey, this is another form of oppression that we are not talking about. And in 1989, which I feel is the best year in the world because it's the year I was born, Dr. Kimberly <laughs> Crenshaw came up with um, the term intersectionality. And she was really trying to define how someone is impacted by multiple systems of oppression. She was an attorney uh, who was representing a woman who was impacted by being a woman working at a job and folks saw how she was impacted as a woman working with men, but they didn't see how the intersections of race impacted her. And so it's the same thing for fat phobia. We think about all of these things like our personality, our gender identity, our race, our age, nationality, and how all of that makes up our life. But a lot of times we don't talk about one of those big things and that's your body, um, your body type, your appearance, how you present to other people. And fat phobia is included in that. Also with our body image and stigma, more than 40% of US adults across a range of body sizes um, and even greater numbers abroad report experiencing stigma at some point in their life, according to the International Journal of Obesity. And now we know that there is not, you know, this huge number um, of 40% of adults that are, you know, in larger bodies, but 40% of people who are in living in the United States are experiencing issues with their own body image. And this is huge, y'all. This means that people are experiencing issues around how they feel about themselves. And that's that internalized stigma. So there's really two types of stigma. That's that external stigma that people face, which is folks looking at people. And if you think about it from a larger body perspective, if you are existing in a larger body, people have a lot to say about fat bodies. They have a lot to say about how plus size people show up in spaces, how we exist. I was doing a training one time, Dr. Constance, and this lady, we were talking about HIV stigma, and it was a training. I was so excited um, to present this information around HIV stigma, especially because it was yeah. women who were living with HIV. And she looked at me and she said, well, and I was up there facilitating, thinking I'm doing everything right. And she looks at me and goes, oh, so it's stigma. Like if I saw you in the grocery store and I made fun of you um, because you were picking up ice cream. And I was mortified. Yes, this happened uh -huh. last year. This happened six months ago. I was mortified because here I stand just trying to give out information, trying to disseminate information, and someone's looking at my body, making judgment calls on what my body looks like. And I'll and definitely, yeah, get into some of that later too, but your body size has nothing to do with you wanting ice cream, right? right. And so people pass judgment 
on food choices in any given moment simply based on what their perceived ideas of what you should be eating, right? Which is inappropriate, but I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> no, no, you're so right. <laughs> I love that. Like, how dare you? You don't know if I have a thyroid issue. You don't know if my medication um, is impacting my weight. You don't know what's going on with my body. So for you to make a judgment call directly impacts my life. You don't know what I'm going through mentally. You don't know how my weight gain impacts my mental health. So folks saying stuff like that. So you can definitely impact you. And then another thing that we didn't talk about is that internalized stigma. So those 40% of adults who are thinking about their bodies um, and thinking about how they don't like their bodies, that's that internalized stuff sometimes. So internalized stigma is that stuff that we tell ourselves as folks that are living in larger bodies, like no one's going to love me, um, no one's going to care for me. And it's the stuff that we tell ourselves and not necessarily what society puts on us. But the external stigma is definitely what society puts on us. And then over into the access of healthcare. I don't know how many people have experienced this that live in larger bodies, but every time I go to the doctor, the first thing they want to talk about is my weight. Um, they don't want to talk about um, how I'm feeling, the things I'm experiencing. They want to definitely discuss my weight. So fat phobia may lead to individuals delaying or avoid seeking healthcare altogether because we already know the first thing that's gonna come to mind from a healthcare provider standpoint is our BMI, is our body mass, talking about how you can lose weight and feel better. I remember going to the doctor as a 10 year old and it was the first time I started gaining weight and my provider was so focused on my weight gain that he missed the fact that I was experiencing asthma symptoms. And a couple months later at my aunt's house who had asthma was noticing that I was exacerbated and my dad was like oh it's because she's gained weight but in reality it was because I had asthma and so my care my um doctor my PCP at the time he didn't notice it because he was so focused on that so this delay can result in preventative care for people who are living in the larger bodies it can delay diagnosis of certain medical conditions and it can have overall poor health outcomes for people that exist in larger bodies. And I wanna kind of talk about some of the intersectional discrimination. Individuals with larger bodies may experience fat phobia differently based on their race or ethnicity. As some people may know, when people are living in different countries or different, um, different spaces, larger bodies may be a great thing. There are countries over in Africa that actually feed uh, the women in the community because women in the community who are existing in larger bodies are seen as desirable. Um, that's a good thing to have a good. It's a good thing to be voluptuous. Even in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, we saw a lot of paintings of cherubs and uh, the cherub angels would be larger. They would have rounder faces and rounder features because back then it was seen as, oh, that person can afford food. They must be angelic. They must have money. They must be great. Um, so sometimes stereotypes and cultural biases may impact the way in which someone's bodies look. And we know so much that women um, and women of trans experience and cisgender women and non-binary individuals experience forms of fat phobia differently than our male counterparts. Society often imposes these rigid beauty standards on women and they associate our worth with different body types. Um, I know in the Black community, if you are a curvier woman, if you have a particular body type, you may look more desirable to Black men. Um, but if you have that same body type and you are a Caucasian woman, you may not be as desirable to uh, Caucasian men. So it definitely depends upon the different, um, your racial identity, your gender identity, and different cultural biases. So here's what we can do around fat phobia. We can avoid stigmatizing terms. Me, for me, I like to use the labels um, like fat, but some 
people that exist in larger bodies may not like that. So it depends on what that person wants to use. Um, I like to say the words larger body. I like to say plus size or full figured. I even use the term BBW because beautiful black woman is me and that's how I identify. So I love using language like that. And we really want to promote body neutrality. So we want to use language that promotes body neutrality better than promoting negative stereotypes. We want to shift our focus and our thought processes from talking about someone's um, health and thinking that their health determines their body. Just like you were saying, Dr. Constance, not everybody's body is going to be, um, not everybody should be talking about our bodies. Just because we're in an ice cream just means I want to get some ice cream. I should be allowed to indulge exactly. and engage in ice cream. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then when we see these stereotypes, we have to challenge them. We got to call truth to power. We have to speak truth to power. We have to tell folks, hey, this is not the type of language we want to use. We will not discriminate against people. And be mindful of the language we use and question those stereotypes. Think about it. Is this rooted in white supremacy? Is this rooted in racism? Um, and is this rooted in a negative stereotype that no longer serves the community that I serve? And that's in, in, in the clinical space, uh, a way that that might manifest itself is when I have a patient who is coming to the office, not being seen for something that could be directly connected to their weight, um, they don't need to get on the scale if they don't want to, right? It's changing the the way that we practice medicine is changing, like you mentioned, the way that we talk to people. Because unless, for example, you had a disease process like congestive heart failure that would be associated with um, increased swelling, and so that weight gain could be related to fluid retention, for example, I might not need to know what your weight is if we're just talking about your mood that particular day. And then you can tell me if you've noticed changes in your weight in relationship to that medical concern, but um, you don't always have to get on the scale. We don't always have to emphasize those things because no matter what your body looks like, right, you can have those weight challenges. Um, so it's important for us to not push agendas and let the, the client or the patient guide um, a piece of the experience that they're having. Definitely. And I love that you said that we don't have to get on the scale for just because someone wants to talk about a mood disorder or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've never heard that. And I'm so glad that you empowered me to be able to go back and tell my healthcare provider if I don't want to get on the scale at that time, hey, I don't need to. This is not something yeah, you that's- you can say it just like that. Care. My weight isn't directly related to why I came today. So I'd like to skip. And if they give you pushback, it. right? That is, you know, a sign to you to have a conversation with the provider, the staff, and kind of see if, you're in line with each other. Yeah, because I, like, I like to say I can hire and fire my healthcare providers and yeah. my health leads. You have yeah. the power. You have the power. I would never fire you though, Dr. Constance. You seem so Thank cool. You. <laughs> <laughs> but every every doctor isn't for everyone, right? So That's right. you just have to be aware of that. And, you know, um, Marnina kind of laid the foundation to talk about fat phobia, especially from the perspective of someone in a larger body. And so now I'm going to continue to bridge the gap talking about how fat phobia can negatively impact your experiences in the healthcare system, but also empowering you to focus more on your overall health and not getting into the weeds of how we, um, focus on weight. And those of you who are able, please put things in the chat, start throwing things into the question answer. I might ask for your opinion on some things. And when in doubt, throw us out some, um, some emojis or whatever you need to do to stay engaged and let us know that you hear us and, and help us feel um, empowered as we continue to present. 
Um, so, um, and you could go to the, do you have the, yep. And so as um, Marnina already mentioned, that there are layers to how we all experience the world. And, you know, right now we're targeting fat phobia, but that's not the only thing that a person in a larger body might have to contend with. There are so many different isms, right, that a person can encounter. So um, imagine already having challenges because your race or in the ethnicity where you live in the world, your socioeconomic status, um, even within your own community, the the tone and color of your skin, how old you are, your your sexual orientation. And then on top of that, you have a larger body, right? That creates challenge after challenge that you might encounter in a day. Um, and so it's important that even while we're having the, this conversation in particular, that we're not forgetting all of the different things that create this vicious web that presents challenges for people. Um, and so why, if you look at these words that are scattered around this slide, lazy, undisciplined, undesirable, inferior, slow, sloppy, ugly, that also overlaps with a lot of the comments that have been made about people of color over the years, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how often is it that people are judged for a, a black person or um other people of color saying, oh, they're they're just we don't like that shape of their eyes, for example, with a a, a Asian person of Asian descent, um, or their skin tone. And to have these words associated with you before someone even meets you is already going to change how you feel about yourself because you're guarded potentially. Um, and so we together have to work on ways to combat that. And um, the way I see it in a healthcare system is starting to focus on an idea called health at every size. And thank you, Jeffrey, we appreciate the support next slide i love that health at every size that's yeah dope. have you heard of that before i that have concept? never heard of this never. okay and it's actually a, a trademark organization so those of you who have never heard of it i would recommend that you look into it and as you can probably see it touches on all of the things that marnina already mentioned weight inclusivity right because remember this is health at every size this isn't even focusing specifically on people in larger bodies um however of course it applies right um making sure that no matter where you are in the world that there is a space for you right um and health enhancement when you walk into the doctor's office the goal is to be your best self no matter what size you are um and so we also talk about life enhancing movement. We're not encouraging people to exercise simply to make their body look a certain way, but because no matter how little or how big you are, you should exercise for health. Same thing, eating for well being. Um, someone might judge a, a person in a larger body for eating ice cream, but the truth of the matter is, food has different purposes. You have food for nutrition and you have food for pleasure. And sometimes that overlaps. If someone decides to eat ice cream today, that today is not going to change what their weight is today, right? It is one serving of one food item. And mm -hmm. in that moment, your emotional well-being and the pleasure of that ice cream was important to you. And that's okay from a health standpoint. And within all of that, above all, people have to be respectful, okay? Above any, any encounter that you have with someone, respect should be at the forefront of the conversation. And that goes back into the weight inclusivity. So what might that look like? The types of chairs that are present in a doctor's office or any space for, for that matter. Um, and I've seen something starting to change even related to travel, right? So what does that look like for a person in a larger body? Um, 
what resources are available to help people feel more comfortable. And these are important conversations to have. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the things to um, consider is more so just your health behaviors being the focus over what your weight is. You could go to the next slide. And, and that's what we're gonna get into um, in the next slide. And the truth is, and we could go to the um, next one, is that knowledge is power, right? So the more you know, the better you can do. I mean, once upon a time, we, we didn't even know that the common cold was a virus, right? And here mm -hmm. we are wearing masks and using antibacterial and all that good stuff because we, when you know better, you do better. And so that's why we're all here today. So we're going to get into some basics on nutrition. And then those of you who are present, we're going to play a little bit of a game, but we'll start with carbohydrates. You know, I don't know. People are so scared of carbohydrates. Okay. But carbs are your basic energy source that you're able to um, obtain fairly quickly. So the simplest form of a carbohydrate is actually sugar, right? So most people know sugar, especially when you think about cane sugar that, you know, domino or whatever that you got in your big tub in the kitchen somewhere, because I have one just like everybody else, even as a doctor, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that is the very simple carbohydrate, but then you have complex carbohydrates that um, fruit and vegetables are also carbs, right? But again, people pass judgment and without that knowledge of really understanding that, um might be a barrier and so um what the difference is when we're looking at carbs is how much nutritional value that you're getting so that same amazing carbohydrate that came from your soda is not going to be as helpful as the carbohydrate that came from your apple right so that soda gives you that quick burst of energy without added vitamins and nutrients Versus the apple, not only are you getting the sugar, but you're getting the vi the vitamins and the fiber from that. And so that starch is really what we're talking about when we're starting to get uh, more complicated. And of course, people think starch is bad, right? They Again, there are layers to the conversation there. And with the fiber, like when I was younger, I never understood the Cheerio commercial and how Cheerios can make your cholesterol better, right? But now that I'm a physician, I understand that the, the soluble fiber that we take in, those things don't all get broken down. And what happens is that in the soluble fiber um, attaches to cholesterol, and then we are able to excrete that. And the insoluble fiber is what helps us have regular bowel movements. So never let anyone uh, make you feel uh, bad for enjoying carbs. It's about the complexity and the quality of the carbs. So that's where we have those conversations about um, brown rice and quinoa and all of those things um, versus white rice and white breads. Also, don't let people um, put you in a box. Just because you have a larger body does not mean that you have diabetes, does not mean that you need to count all of your carbs, okay? So only you know that, you and your health professional. So live your life um, remembering to enjoy those things in moderation. Next slide. And so moving from that, we then talk about protein. And these are basically the building blocks of the body, right? Um, it's important for tissue repair. And um, there are different amino acids that come together to make the proteins. And the thing that people don't fully understand when it comes to this is there are some amino acids that are essential to our life and some that aren't. Those that are essential, we have to get from our food. So you literally cannot live on just um, simple carbs alone. You have to add that complexity in to get that protein. Although keeping in mind some vegetables and dairy have, um, and grains even have protein in them. So surely you can 
be that's how vegetarians can be totally healthy and not have animal protein. I even sometimes encourage people to have periods of time in which they focus on plant-based meals um, because protein can sometimes get you constipated. The animal-based protein, that is, um, can get you constipated. The animal-based protein can is also more likely con to contribute to high cholesterol. And what I like to think about is that beautiful steak that you might see in the, the storefront. It's so beautiful and delicious because of that white marbling all in that, but that fat in the animal, as we consume it, then circulates in our bloodstream. So the more of that you see, the more likely it is to um, impact your health. And that's why we recommend things like lean chicken breasts, and recommend that people cut or trim the fat away before eating to kind of make the food more healthful for them. And then um, the next slide will show the, the newest, this, this has actually been more sensationalized lately, right? Fat. When we start to talk about the keto diet, for example, um, is where that comes in because there is a lot of energy that comes in fat and and fat is important. I mean, that whole like cushion for the pushing thing that people used to say, you know, is it's real. Your organs need cushion. Um some vital uh vitamins are stored in our fat. So knowing that and we absorb some vitamins better through fat. And that's why your vitamin D capsules are like little jelly capsules, there's fat in there to, to make it easier for you to absorb them. So you have to keep that in mind. However, there's always a caveat, right? So just like we talked about the simple carbohydrates versus the more complex carbohydrates is similar when you're talking about fat. And so you have unsaturated fats and those are healthier and they're associated with less heart disease versus trans fats and saturated fats. Um, are more likely to build up in the arteries. And so when you're talking about unsaturated fats, that's going to be your fats that come from things like nuts and avocado and um, extra virgin olive oil versus those trans and saturated fats are going to come from the, your animal protein, the fried foods, the shelf friendly foods that um, Really, if you think about it, things that are solid at room temperature are more likely to become solid in your arteries. So even beloved coconut oil, for example, it does well for cooking, um, mild flavor. It has a lot of health benefits, but if a person has challenges with their cholesterol, that's not the best fat for them to use because it's more likely to contribute to coronary artery disease than, for example, um, a olive oil or a sunflower seed oil would. And then we could go to the next slide. And to sort of wrap it up, um, calories are often, you know, looked at like that's how we sort of decide what we're going to eat, what we're not going to eat. But um, it's important to understand just like where all of these things break down. And that's why I said fat is an amazing source of energy. Nine calories per gram of fat. And believe it or not, right, we villainize carbohydrates, but carbs and protein have the same amount of calories per gram. The, the difference, of course, is how readily the calories that come from carbohydrates are available to us. So again, if you um, eat an apple or watermelon now, um, and I like to use watermelon as example, because uh, we love it so much because it's sweet, um, it's juicy, easy to eat, um, but that is able to be broken down into the body and utilized in the bloodstream a lot more quickly than, for example, eating chicken, right? So you have to chew that, your enzymes have to break that down. Um, so even though that calorie um, count is the same per gram, um, you, you feel a lot more full with even 10 grams of protein versus 10 grams of carbohydrate, for example. Um, and then with the the um, uh, fat as well, sorry, but with the fat, um, 
it helps you feel satisfied. So you shouldn't hide from it. That's why people love things like cheese and um, ice cream because the fat content that's in it is pleasing um, not only to the mind, but to the body. Uh, so small amounts of fat are go a long way in helping us feel our best. And yes, now we could go to the next um, slide. If there are any questions, please do um, put them in the chat. Um, but I sort of mentioned this before, and it's important to bring up here. This is a quick Irish proverb. Laughter is brightest in the place where food is good, right? And um, especially in the Black community, uh, our food is villainized. Um, so the cultural foods that we all grew up on that have literally given birth to a nation are now, we're now told aren't good for us anymore. And uh, the, the comment that I made in regards to the ice cream is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we don't need to have um, fried chicken every day, but there's nothing wrong with fried chicken, right? There is nothing wrong with macaroni and cheese. There is nothing wrong with a sweet potato casserole, okay? Or pie okay. for that matter. Okay, <laughs> so I, I think um, it's not about exactly, it's all about balance. And we'll go to the next slide because um, the thing is, I love food. Who doesn't love food? I think there are very few people who can genuinely say, I don't like food. And literally every food item you see on this screen is something that I cooked for myself. Okay, and so I have homemade pasta in the up upper left hand corner. I have a okra stew with white rice on the right hand side, a salad, salmon with mixed vegetables. But the context of when I ate those foods and how much I ate of them is going to vary from day to day based on what my personal health goals are. And it's for you to decide what your goals are and um, losing weight gaining weight, whatever the case may be, is not the primary focus. It's about finding that balance and what works for you. And generally, when you do those things, everything comes into focus. And we'll go on to the next slide. And, um, and so someone said they thought that they were doing something when they stopped eating meat. And for some people, that's actually... Um, not a bad choice to make but then you have to ask why are you doing that specifically what's the goal that you want to achieve when you do that and making sure that you're getting the best balance um but if you had additional questions with that or um thoughts i love to talk about that a little bit um as well because and and please chime in on this why do you enjoy food so Farnina, can can you say specifically, are there, like, do you have, like, a top three reasons, maybe? Of why Ooh, you I would say food? that, for me, food is communal. Um, yes. I love to feed people. It is my joy. Um, making sure that folks around me are fed and they're happy and healthy um, makes me excited. I also like food because cooking was a thing with me and my grandmother, um, and she's no longer with us, but every time I make her recipes, every time I eat something that she's made in the past, it makes me smile. It brings up those memories. I also love food because it's good. Like, yes. <laughs> exactly. like on my period, baby, please give me some chocolate ice cream with possibly some chocolate chips in it. Um, if I am... <laughs> If I'm like in a snacky mood or I want something to crunch on, I love a good hot Cheeto. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I love to, um, yeah. um, Takis. That's sort of like crept up on me um, here in the last, uh, like the end of the year. But yeah, and people also put in the chat that they um, also love feeding, cooking and feeding people and that food reminds them of family. And that's the same for me. Um I'd rather cook than go out to eat, right? But then people would make someone believe that um, going out to eat is like totally bad. And we could get into that a little bit 
um, as well. Or that if you cook at home, you're going to be totally healthy all the time. It's not, you know, it's not mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. right? There, there are different reasons for enjoying food and, and, and the process of eating is not simply to fuel your body. It's, it's intertwined. We're humans, right? We're not robots. So we're not going, you know, for all change, right? This is, right. if you got to do it, you might as well enjoy it, right? And so we're going to have layers. And so we'll go to the, um, the next slide. And now that we know what we enjoy about it, what's challenging about eating healthy food? So um, I know for me, one of the challenges certainly is access, right? And so with access, another layer to that is time, right? So perhaps there is access to the food, but then you don't have the time to go get it. Um, McDonald's is a lot faster than Kava, right? Um, so the way the accessibility of food is challenging and and someone says access, yes, not healthy food is so much cheaper. And and then certainly depending on how you approach that, um it's is daunting, right? And so hopefully in this last little bit of the presentation. Um, by the time we get to the end, I can offer some insight on ways that you could do that a little bit differently, but we'll go to the next slide. So, I think for me, before we go to the next slide, Dr. Yeah. Constance, I wanted to say that 30% of my job is travel. Like right now I'm in a hotel room um, and because I am in Atlanta for work. And so it is so challenging because during the day I'm facilitating trainings, I'm up and I'm excited. But then afterwards I come to the hotel and what's the one thing I want to do? Maybe I'm order some room service. Maybe I want to like yep. go out and eat with friends. It's not always about um, not having, not wanting to cook the food because I would love to cook at home, but it's the access like you stated. Yep. yep. And so now we're going to play a little bit of a game. So this is an interesting way for us to start changing how we think about food and how we interact with food. And this game is called Spot the Difference. Um, so there will be a picture on the left and a picture on the right. And it'll start off kind of easy and then get a little harder. So let's look at this picture here. So we see that there's some yogurt some oatmeal and some strawberries. So this one is pretty straightforward, right? Um, we're just getting our feet wet. You know, by just looking at the picture, you think, oh, it's, it's just the strawberries, right? Um, and so if we had to guess, which side do you think has the least amount of calories? Marnina, you wanna? Yeah, definitely. I I right now. <laughs> come on than a white constant <laughs> um, I think that the one on the left has the less calories because it's the less food okay so let's go to the next slide this is great I'm excited so the one on the left is actually more calories looks can be deceiving right so although there are fewer strawberries, the amount of um, oatmeal in that cup is more on the left than it is on the right. Oh, and wow. so it's the, it's the same amount of yogurt, right? The same exact container, um, but you gain a little bit more calories because of that little bit of extra oatmeal. And so when you think about it, again, it's all about the balance right those the oatmeal is fairly quick and easy and and of course this is like uncooked oatmeal so you can't really like see of course you would add a few calories here and there if you use milk versus water i i don't eat oatmeal as often but when i do i'm going to add some nuts i'm going <laughs> i'm going to add some something to it cuz the texture um, but this is just an idea. So if someone was really trying to think, where can I gain a little bit of traction? Eat the fruit. The fruit is great. It has a lot of nutrients and it's lower in calories, right? Um, and then you're going to have the same yogurt. That's not going to change, but just a little bit less yogurt. So like that was a really good one to start with that when you're thinking about cutting calories, don't cut the fruit. 
that's not the place to do it. Okay. The fruit, the vegetables, that's generally not the place to do it. Um, it's going to be more of the, the protein or the carbs in this case. So we'll go to the the next slide. So this might be a pretty standard lunch for many people, right? It's a salad with steak, tons of vegetables, a, a little um, vermicelli noodles, and then some um, avocado. So Marnina, my lovely co-presenter, which one do you think has the, the higher number of calories? I'm going to say the one on the left has more calories. Okay. And what makes you say that? Um, It looks like it has more noodles. I'm not okay. sure, but it looks like it has more noodles. Uh-huh. What else? Um, also, because it has an extra um, slice of avocado. And what I've been told is that avocado um, is a fat and it um has more calories That's there you saying. go and we kind of just like went over that too right lots of great nutrients in that avocado but because fat is calorie heavy right that little extra slice of avocado is going to kind of take things over the edge so we'll go to the next slide um and so yes exactly someone said good fats definitely has good fat um, and so uh, when we're looking at this, and, and I just want to add here, it's, it's a good point to add this. I personally don't see foods as good food versus bad food, but good food versus better food. And so when we're Ooh. looking at these pictures, right, this isn't to um, villainize any food or really having the conversation about um, is this bad for me or is this good for me? But when people have specific health goals in mind or when they're trying to make traction on whatever um, uh, thing that they want to achieve, whether that's improve their cholesterol, right, or um, improve their blood sugar, these are some of the ways to do that. And with those adjustments, you see that the calories go down. Um, and so it's just kind of offering perspective that, these, even the good things, right, are going to change the bottom line, right? So very similar salad. All of the ingredients are similar, if not the same. But like you mentioned, there's a cup of noodles on the left side and a half of a cup of rice noodles on the other side. Also, the steak on the right was grilled instead of cooked in oil. And then there's less avocado on the left side. And, and, and then to add some substance, right? They added some cherry tomatoes, added some carrot and used a little less oil to, to kind of create a dressing for the salad. So again, if, if, I, if someone put the salad on the right in front of me, I wouldn't even bat an eye right? But I got um, a little bit more balance as far as the fat to carb to protein ratio. And so we have one more to look at. And this one is a little bit easier to see as well. Um, and so you can see on the left, there is, it's, you know, it's Taco Tuesday in this household, right? And so they have the soft tortillas, um, with the meat and the tomatoes and the lettuce and the avocado. But Marnina, if you'll go to the um, the next slide there, you can see that it's such a dramatic difference without significant change in the amount of substance that you're putting on top of your um, taco. And so in this case, in addition to some ground beef, they added beans, which is gonna give you great fiber right? Um, there's iron in beans as well. And there's protein, of course, in both the beans and the ground beef in this one. But because you use a leaner ground beef in a smaller taco shell, um, you, you get a difference of 400 calories with just some um, minimal adjustments. And so while we want to break the, the stigma 
of fat phobia, we also want to focus on health, right? And so these are some of those ways that we can start to say, hmm, is there something that I can adjust? Because all of these meals were totally healthy, right? But when we look at the balance of them, that's something that we all can work on. It doesn't matter what size your body is. So I thought this was like an important um, topic to have, just how little adjustments um, can make a difference. And we'll go to the next slide um, because this kind of gives a framework and I'd be happy to send this out as, um, like the actual PDF of this, we talk about the Mediterranean diet, which of course diet, we always think about restricting things. And if we're truly focusing on health, we're again, we're not villainizing any food, we're finding that balance. And we need to find a way of eating that works for our body. So whether that's vegetarian, pescatarian, sometimes I like to call myself a flexitarian, so some days I'm not going to eat meat and some days I will, you know, that's just, it just depends on how I feel. But this is a tactic that you can use to find that balance. You're not getting rid of anything, right? But you're adjusting how you approach it to make things more healthful um, for your life. And Marnina, you mentioned socializing. This socializing with a meal is one of the things that is included in the Mediterranean diet. When you're tuned in to communal eating, you're less focused on the pleasure centers that that food instills in you and more on the people you're enjoying the time with. How often have we had Thanksgiving dinner and by the time you get to the end, you're like, I ain't, I barely even ate, right? Mm -hmm. I've done you that. you were so busy cooking, you were so busy socializing, that it sort of take took your mind. That's probably not the best thing. Like we still need to eat, right? Cause that mac and cheese is going to be gone if you didn't go up there and get it. But <laughs> <laughs> it is a way to sort of change your perception when we're just mindly, mindlessly eating in front of the TV where we're, we're going to eat a lot more than when we're engaging with family and friends. Um, have your alcohol, but a, a true pour of um wine is about five ounces. So I'm just going to leave that out there. Don't drink the whole bottle, y'all. Okay. It's good for you, but don't overindulge. But a little bit of alcohol is actually, has actually been attributed to positive health gains. So um again, moderation is important. Um, And so basically the, the simple premise, I like to, two simple concepts. Focus on natural foods as best you can, right? Um, but also having flexibility. I think the biggest thing that we miss is when you try to restrict yourself from things, you often overdo it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it leads you to binge eat and, and overindulge versus focusing on that chocolate ice cream with chocolate chips with a, a side of hot Cheetos because it's your period and you like that and it makes you feel good you enjoy it um and then tomorrow you might have a salad so you know we could tell the person who judged you to kick rocks about the ice cream you picked up because that ice cream is probably going to be in the freezer for a month right like um and then we'll sort of go to the next slide um, when in doubt, remember, take baby steps. So you don't have to change completely overnight, but putting yourself out there to tell someone, I don't want to get on the scale today. That's not related to my visit, right? Um, not being afraid to pick up the Takis and the spinach in the same grocery store run, right? That I always say it's nice to have balance, right? The salad with the French fries, that's so much better, right? I mean, it <laughs> <have> is. You... <laughs> right? And that's somewhere to start. Don't let people make you feel bad for your cultural foods. I think that's a big thing to consider as well. Um, and when you focus on your health at the forefront of everything, it's going to all come together. And I think we're like right on time to take questions and so yep I put that's my 
logo there but thank you all for listening i'd love to we'd both love to take any questions or comments that you might have yes i would love to <laughs> this was so informative dr uh constance i learned a lot so typically when i think about food i get scared because i'm like oh my gosh like the food oh, isn't yeah. yeah like i'm eating bad foods but I could just change some of the ways in which I do it. I thought coconut oil was good for you. I'm finding out now that coconut oil isn't the best way to well, go. And, it's, and I think, again, I we often take certain recommendations or thoughts like out of context, right? Because while coconut oil can um, negatively impact um, your cholesterol, that might not be a problem for you. And so... Mm appropriately incorporating coconut oil into your diet is not a bad thing but again if you only cook with coconut oil for example mm -hmm. is where you might have some challenges but if you went to your doctor six months from now and they took you know your cholesterol is a bit elevated and you're like you know what i've been using coconut oil every day almost maybe <laughs> i need to rein it in a little bit you know so every body's problem isn't everybody's problem if that makes any mm, sense and i think that that's one of the challenges that um yeah grapeseed oil is a good one also a very mild oil but um like how many times have you um have you been somewhere and somebody got a little lightheaded and they like ooh, ooh give them give them a cracker give them a piece of candy their blood sugar probably low how you know what if it was too high oh that's a good one right and then you just gave them some sugar and you made it worse oh what if they I'm had guessing. palpitations and that's why they got lightheaded it's because their heart rate is going too far fast i, I we need to i think we um we pass judgments right and we make assumptions um based on things so uh again we gotta we gotta all stay on our lane and so someone said they recently heard about the 54321 grocery method to help save money and have a balanced meal. Five veggies, four fruits, three proteins, and two sauces and one grain. One thing I will add to that is let's bring community back into how we navigate our grocery shopping. Um, again, when you are strapped for time, it's harder to do this, but why not get a Sam's card, split the membership with a friend, and then you guys can buy bulk together and share some of the cost burden, right? So it might mm. not be some place that you go to often, but once a month, you know, apples hold very well. Those are one of those fruits that you can like leave out on your counter for quite some time and they, they are not going to spoil, I promise you. And um, you manage your costs manage accessibility right um meal mm -hmm. sharing and i've seen this happen on um social media as well take turns cooking a meal with friends right you make a a, a batch of chili somebody else you know might do a casserole and you ration it out here's your portion of the food i'll take my portion of the food and then you have your lunch and your dinner for three days because you split the burden right oh, I I like there, there are creative ways um to sort of address that that kind of decreases some of the burden don't be nervous to go to community meals here in Wilmington um we have organizations that do community meals quite often and there's no judgment they use fresh produce um don't be afraid of frozen fruits and vegetables especially when I'm going to have it with yogurt I love frozen strawberries and um blueberries because it kind of creates its own syrup when it um thaws out and boom, you ain't have to pay your play. You go, you go get the big jug <laughs> and you ration it out yourself. You know, again, different ways to kind of navigate that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that five, four, three, two, one is like a great way to approach it. And grains usually go far. Um they last a long time. I ain't never thrown away no rice. 
never spoil. I've never thrown that thrown away yeah. rice. And what I learned recently too, because I found out about the five, four, three, two, one method about grocery shopping on TikTok. And mm-hmm. what I also found out on TikTok, I love TikTok. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> What I also found out is that honey doesn't spoil. So like it's one of those foods. It'll crystallize, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never knew that. And I recently found a farmer who actually has like a beehive and Mm -hmm. he makes fresh honey. And so what he'll do is he'll cut off some of the honey hive. I mean, some of the beehive and put it actually in the honey. And it's so cool. It's the the most greatest thing ever. (laughs) Yeah. And then, like, if your um honey crystallizes a little bit, sometimes people might think, oh, it's gone. Just pop it in the microwave for a little bit. It'll soften it up. Really? Okay, that is so cool. Yep. <laughs> Destiny's <Okay>. back, so. <laughs> She's yeah. pulling us off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I learned so much. Thank you. Um, and for sharing your knowledge and your experiences and your wisdom. Um, And thank you everyone for attending the Focusing on Health and Wellness, Getting Beyond Fat Phobia Stereotypes webinar this evening. Um, I will place a survey in the chat for you to take first, please. Um, So just give us some feedback. And then we encourage everyone to sign up for SoTime and follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates on upcoming webinars and join our mailing list for future updates. Our next webinar is HIV is Not a Crime with Monique Moray, moderated by Ashley Daniels on February 28th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I will put the link to registration in the chat as well. Um, Additionally, every third Wednesday of the month, we hold a hybrid group meeting for Black women living with HIV from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in attending the meeting, um, I will put that contact information in the chat. for those who are interested in attending to the third Wednesday of the month meetings. Um, and then thank you again and everyone have a nice evening. Um, I hope you all learned something. <laughs>